Hello, and welcome to the first video in my series about oscillators. Now, oscillators are ubiquitous in electronics. They're used just about everywhere. They're used to produce audio frequencies, which can then produce vibrations in the air that we hear as sound, so they can be used as different kinds of tone generators for whatever purpose or for musical instruments. And they're also used in radio circuits, either to produce radio waves or in radio receivers. They're also necessary. We'll talk about that down the road in communication circuits. And they're also used in digital circuits. In most digital circuits, particularly computer type circuits, something happens every time there is a clock pulse. The clock pulses make things happen. And these clock pulses are produced by oscillators. And analog television was the apex of analog technology before that was taken over by digital systems. And analog television systems had more oscillators than you could shake a stick at. So oscillators are an important part of electronics in the past, present, and on into the future. So let's talk about what oscillation is, what oscillators are, and how we make electronic oscillators. So what is the definition of oscillation? I looked that up in the American Heritage Dictionary and I got the action of oscillating. I didn't get much better in other dictionaries either, but Wikipedia has this definition, and I like it. Oscillation is the repetitive or periodic variation, typically in time, of some measure about a central value, often a point of equilibrium, or between two or more different states. So oscillation is to go back and forth between one thing and another. In one dictionary definition I found it said to go between two points of view. Okay, we've heard that to oscillate between two political views, perhaps. So oscillation is basically to go back and forth, although that back and forth may end up being up and down, or it may be a compression and decompression, such as a sound wave. But it's something that is periodic and changes between two limits going across some middle value. So let's look at some things that oscillate. One thing would be pendulums, and we find pendulums in a number of places. For example, pendulum clocks use a pendulum to keep the time. So we have a rod with a weight on the end, and we get that going back and forth, and it swings between two limits going between some norm in the middle. We also get the same kind of motion in a child swing, and if you've ever gone to a science museum, you've probably seen a Foucault pendulum, which is a very large pendulum suspended on a wire, which goes across a, you know, maybe a three or four meter area. And they use blocks that the pendulum will knock over as its plane of swinging rotates because of the rotation of the Earth. So the Foucault pendulum is used to demonstrate the rotation of the Earth. So let's explain why a pendulum oscillates. If we have it hanging from a string, gravity is pulling it down, and without some kind of disturbance, nothing's going to happen. But let's pull that pendulum back and hold it, and what has changed? Well, now it's higher above the ground, and it will be lower at the middle of the arc between the two high points that it will go to while it's swinging. And all things want to be at the lowest state of energy, and in the gravity that we are in now, it will be in the lowest state of energy here, so it's going to swing toward that lower place. But by the time it gets to the middle, where it wants to be, it has momentum, and it's moving in that direction, so it's going to overshoot and go over to its other limit. And then we're in the same situation again, where we have the potential energy from gravity wanting to pull it back down to the middle, and it will swing back overshooting because now it has momentum in the other direction on over to the other side. So that is why a pendulum oscillates. It keeps trading potential energy for kinetic energy back to potential energy and back and forth and it keeps swinging. Another thing that oscillates would be a weight on a spring. I have a illustration of that here. So if we have the object just sitting there, nothing's going to happen, but if we pull it down, it's going to want to be pulled up by the spring, but of course it pulls up to its natural equilibrium point, goes past that because of momentum, and now gravity is going to pull it down and it's going to oscillate up and down. Other things that oscillate are a musical instrument string, like a piano string or a violin string, and these kind of oscillate in a different way than you might think. Here's a 
video of a violin string oscillating and I think it's real interesting that you actually see a wave going back and forth on the string not quite the same way I see it illustrated in physics books and a piano string does the same thing if you watch a piano string vibrating you see it will vibrate stop and then vibrate again because that's actually a wave going back and forth down the string but then we still have that oscillation on that string another thing that will oscillate is jello give the jello a little tap and it's going to jiggle it goes between two states of potential energy and passes through a state of kinetic energy giving you that jiggle and it might jiggle up and down back and forth and uh, always fun to look at and another interesting type of oscillation that we might find is called a fugoid and this is caused by pilots has happened a lot of times in test programs but it does sometimes happen in operational airplanes where the airplane gets out of control such that it pitches up and the pilot pushes forward on the controls to pitch it back down but he overdoes it so it goes through its point of equilibrium down low so now the pilot's going to pull back on the controls on the stick or the yoke or in an airbus the side stick that's going to pull it back up but overreacting again it goes up and gets too high and he has to push down on the stick again and one of the reasons this happens is because the pilot can't react fast enough and to get out of the fugoid he has to anticipate what's happening and get ahead of the fugoid instead of behind it sometimes this is called a pilot induced oscillation or a PIO and basically the pilot keeps giving the push or pull to the controls at just the right time to keep the oscillation going and that's kind of important because in electronic oscillators we have to do kind of the same thing now one thing that all of these things that oscillate have in common except for the fugoid is that they will dampen out so for example if we go back to the pendulum here's our pendulum swinging back and forth in its arc but as it does so it's going to encounter air resistance and there's going to be some friction at the fulcrum where it attaches and going to convert some of its energy into heat and so as air friction converts energy into heat and the mechanical friction up here does the same it's going to lose energy and of course it's going to swing back and forth less and less and less and eventually if you don't put any more energy back in it's going to come to a stop so the pendulum in a clock has a mechanism called the escapement that is powered usually by a spring or by weights that will put energy back into the pendulum with each swing so it goes over gets a kick and gets a kick each time it goes one way so that keeps it going it has to give it just the right amount of kick so that it doesn't go too far and your Foucault pendulums also have a similar mechanism they will go for a very long time once you get them going because of their weight and their efficiency because of their size but they will lose energy and so there's a mechanism somewhere up in the top of your Foucault pendulum at your science museum that gives it a little kick every time it swings so that it doesn't eventually dampen out and come to a stop so those are some things that oscillate some characteristics of uh, the things that oscillate so an oscillator is something that oscillates but has some way of kicking that energy back into it so that it keeps oscillating so a clock is a type of oscillator a Foucault pendulum is a type of oscillator and I already talked about the fugoid where the pilot keeps adding controls at just the right time inadvertently to keep the oscillations going or actually to make them worse so we have oscillations things that oscillate and then oscillators are things that continue to oscillate so what are the key requirements to making an oscillator well we have to have something that oscillates but what we think about is one we're going to have to have some amplification because we have to have something that kicks energy back in so the amplifier is something that kicks in that energy we also have to have feedback something that tells it when to give that little kick at just the right time so we have to have feedback and we have to have a time delay because like in the fugoid the reason that the pilot gets into those oscillations is because his reaction to the oscillation is delayed and so instead of dampening the oscillation he kicks more energy into it so we have to have some kind of a time delay
and that's coupled with the feedback to give us positive feedback. I'll just write positive over here. So we need positive feedback, which is a result of feedback and a time delay. So they work together to do that. What I mean by positive feedback is that, once again, in the fugoid, to damp that out, the pilot would want to give negative feedback to operate the controls opposite of what the plane wants to do. The plane is going up and down. He needs to do just the opposite, but because of the time delay and the way he reacts to it, instead of giving it negative feedback, he gives it positive feedback. In other words, putting energy in at the wrong time, making the fugoid get even worse. And another thing we need is, in the amplification, is unity gain. And what I mean is a gain of one, technically, meaning that if, if we have less than unity gain or less than the gain of one, our oscillations are going to damp out and they'll eventually stop. So a pendulum without something to keep the pendulum going is eventually going to dampen out and stop. But if we keep it going, if we push it too hard, having a gain of more than one, that means with each swing, it's going to get higher and higher and higher and maybe even go all the way around eventually. So we have to have just the right amount of gain, which is unity or a gain of one, so that it does not either dampen out or swing too much, depending on what kind of oscillator you have. So we'll be looking at this again when we look at electronic oscillators, because these are in our mechanical oscillators we've been talking about, and we'll find we have the same thing in electronic oscillators. Now let's go back and take a look at our pendulum to find another thing about oscillators that isn't always true, but we often want. So let's look at that pendulum swinging back and forth. And now let's look at it instead of from the side, let's look up from the bottom. So now I'm going to redraw this. Here's our pendulum weight, the string or wire or arm, whatever it's attached to is straight through it. And this pendulum, we're going to have it go up and down on the board. So it's going to swing this way and then that way, then this way, then that way. So we're looking at it from the bottom up and our orientation is such that it's swinging longitudinally along our line of sight. Now let's compensate for the fact that it's swinging in a curve to get just the right amount of movement. So here it's going to be going by pretty fast, but it's going to slow down, slow down, slow down, stop. Speed up, speed up, speed up. Fastest, slow down, slow down, slow down, stop. And now what we're going to do is move that pendulum across our line of sight and see how it goes when it's moving across our line of sight at the same time it's going up and down. So let's move it over to here. There's its swinging path. And so now it's going to go up and up and up and up, stop, go back down, speed up, faster, slower, 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 stop, speed up, faster, 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 slower, 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 stop, and look at the shape it's taking. Now another way to get this same shape is to take something circular, such as this CD, and put a dot on it and have that dot go around and around, so we'll see that go around in a circle, right? Now what we do is turn that sideways and we're going to get the same kind of motion we saw on this pendulum, except that it's caused by it going in a circle instead of back and forth. So we'll see that dot go fast as it goes by the middle, but as it goes across the top, it'll slow down to stop and then speed up as it goes across the backside. And as it goes around, we get the same back and forth motion that we see looking at the pendulum, assuming that the pendulum's compensated for its curved path. Here the curved path is part of the mechanism. Now, if we move this across your line of sight, as it rotates, what's going to happen to that spot? It's going to make the same kind of shape, exactly the same. So that spot is going around a circle. So there's a very close relationship between this shape and a circle. And this shape, at any point along it, we can calculate what the amplitude of that point is, how far it is from the center, by the sine of the angle. So if this is 360 degrees, so this is that spot going around a full circle on the round object, 
Well, that's going around 360 degrees, so we would do the same thing here. Say that's 360 degrees. If we take the sine of the angle, we can calculate where this spot will be anywhere along this curve. So we call that a sine wave. And that is a wave of a single frequency. If we have any other frequencies mixed in, we get a different shape. And so the pendulum is a good example of that because the pendulum is going to be very hard to have any frequency other than its natural swinging frequency. And so if we watch that go across our line of sight or if we plot its position over time on a graph, there are the ways to look at it, we're going to see this particular shape that we call a sine wave. Now it's important to know that if we have other frequencies mixed in, we get other shapes. And I talk about that in more detail in the AC circuits class. But just real quickly, if we add, oh, let's say this is 100 cycles per second. So this is going to take 100th of a second. If we were able to impart in another frequency, and let's say that frequency was the third harmonic or 300 cycles per second, that's going to cause our sides to steepen and it's going to pull down the top and make our wave look more like this. So that would be what we get if we have two frequencies at the same time, the fundamental or the first harmonic, and then three times that frequency, the third harmonic. So there's our 300 hertz. So it's actually going up and down three times in the time that this goes up and down once, but you put them together and you would get a different shape. And if we add the fifth harmonic five times the frequency, then we would get an even steeper side, a flatter top and steeper, kind of mangling my drawing here, but as we add odd harmonics, we're going to get a flatter and flatter top and steeper and steeper sides. So eventually we would end up with our pendulum, if we could do this, going instantly there, instantly there, instantly there, instantly there, and hovering at the ends. Of course, we can't do that with a pendulum, but we can do it with other mechanisms, and we would get what we call a square wave. And if we take those same odd harmonics and add them together in a different way. Let's go ahead and draw this a different way. There's our pendulum that we can imagine we can add extra frequencies to. And there's our sine wave. Now we're going to add the third harmonic, but instead of going up at the same time, the third harmonic is going to be 180 degrees out of phase. In other words, its timing is going to be such that the harmonic, there's our three waves, but notice that instead of going up with this one, it's going down first. So what that's going to do, if we get this out of the way here, is that's going to pull down the sides and it's going to push up the top. I'm going to curve that up, give us a shape more like, this is exaggerated, but it's going to look more like that. And if we add the fifth harmonic, back this way. So the third harmonic is out of phase, the fifth harmonic is in phase. That's going to pull these sides back out a little bit, pull down that top a little bit, and eventually as we add odd harmonics, reversing the phase each time, we're going to get a triangle wave. And then if we take all of the harmonics, I don't remember off the top of my head how the phasing is, but I talk about that in the AC class, so I don't have to remember right now. But if we do odd harmonics, we can get a wave that looks like that, a sawtooth wave. And if we add the harmonics in the opposite way, we get a sawtooth wave that looks like... That's a mess, isn't it? Well, the difference is one of our sawtooth waves goes up steeply, then slopes down, up steeply, then slopes down, and the other one goes sloping up and then down steeply, sloping up and down steeply. And this depends on how you add the phases of all of the harmonics, both even and odd. And so those are just some different wave shapes. I wanted to cover those real quickly because if we have frequencies other than the natural frequency of the oscillating device, we're going to get wave shapes other than sine waves. And sine waves are sometimes the holy grail of an oscillator. Sometimes we don't want sine waves, but most often we do. So we want our electronic oscillator to, once again, looking up from the bottom, 
We want our electronic oscillator to oscillate at a single frequency and produce sine waves, unless we have some reason that we want square waves like in a computer system or other shapes like a musical synthesizer likes other shapes. And um, just keep in mind that if we have something other than a sine wave, we have lots of other frequencies that we call harmonics mixed in with that one pure frequency that we would get with a pendulum. So now that we've looked at some of the requirements for an oscillator, what an oscillator is, let's take a look at some actual oscillators. And you've been in one. It's called an auditorium. So let's say we have a speaker in an auditorium. I don't mean a loudspeaker, but a person speaker, somebody talking. There's a microphone, and here's a person talking into it. And somewhere there's a loudspeaker or more. I'll just draw that as a speaker cone up here. And let's take a look at the way the system works for a moment. First of all, we have an amplifier in here somewhere. I'll just have our standard amplifier drawing that's going to power that speaker and get its energy from the microphone. The microphone, I like to use the dynamic microphone as an example because it's easy to understand quickly. It has a diaphragm that vibrates with sound. Attached to that diaphragm is a coil of wire, and that coil of wire is in a magnetic field. And so as that vibrates, it creates currents. So as I'm speaking, I'm producing sound waves, which are vibrations in the air. They're compression waves in the air. And when they hit that diaphragm, they cause it to vibrate at the same frequency. I'm producing frequencies from around maybe 100 hertz to maybe 4,000 hertz. And so when that sound is causing that diaphragm to come towards me, it causes current in one direction, but when it's going away from me, it causes current in the other direction. So that's basically how the microphone works, and the speaker is the opposite. It has the same elements. It has a paper diaphragm with a coil of wire around it that coils in a magnetic field, and now we put those currents into the coil, and when the current goes one way, that speaker moves towards me, or the speaker, or toward the audience, and when the current goes the opposite direction, that speaker cone goes away. So as I'm vibrating that diaphragm, I'm producing voltages that go up and down and they are amplified, sent to the speaker and make that speaker move exactly the same way so we get a louder version of the sound that I'm making. And that works really great when it works correctly. But we all know what happens if we turn that sound up a little too high. Well we get what we call feedback. Well, it's not feedback, it's oscillations caused by feedback. So let's look at what's happening there. I speak into the microphone. In fact, I might not even be speaking. Let's say I would just walk up to the microphone and just the little currents of air pressure that I'm making as I walk by, let's say that sound is turned up to just the right level in the auditorium, and I walk by and it causes that diaphragm to give a little move. So the diaphragm moves this way, goes through the amplifier and causes the speaker to do the same thing. Now let's say the speaker is 3.3 meters away from the microphone. So that speaker is going to give that little push and that's going to cause a compression wave, bigger than I'm making with my mouth, to come through the air. And it's going to come down, of course, to the audience, but some of that compression wave is going to hit that microphone and cause that diaphragm to move again. And with that speaker, 3.3 meters away, it's going to take one hundredth of a second for that sound to reach the microphone again. So, let's see what's going to happen. Erase some of this clutter here. So, I speak, or a little bit of a puff of air makes the diaphragm move, makes this move. So we have a sound wave come out, just one pulse. And then a hundredth of a second later, that diaphragm moves again from that pulse. And so that moves and it moves again up here. So we get a, I'll just show it like this, just a little spike. And then a hundredth of a second later, we get another one because it comes from that speaker. Well, that causes the speaker to move again. And so we get another pressure wave comes through and a hundredth of a second later, it hits the microphone again, which of course causes the speaker to move, and we get another compression wave comes back down, another hundredth of a second, 
And that's just going to keep going on and on and on until one of two things happens. Well, depends on how the amplifier is set. Also depends on the room acoustics, the uh, way the microphone's made. Uh, microphones are usually made for this type of venue to be sensitive in this direction, but not from that direction to minimize this problem. But it's hopefully going to damp out, get less and less and less and less. You might hear a little bit of a whoop, little tone or something at 100 hertz, and then it goes away. You've heard that in auditoriums where it, you just get this little ring that goes away and another ring that goes away. Someone's speaking, you get this little ring, 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 ring. That's what's happening is we get, we're getting these pulses like that. But the other thing that could happen, or actually there's two other things that could happen. So three things could happen. Either it's going to dampen out and go away, or it's going to get just enough energy to just keep on going and going. And that's exactly what it's going to do. You've heard it in an auditorium. Someone gets too close to the microphone, makes a little noise or something, and makes a tone, and it just keeps on going and going and going. Or the other one is, amplifies just a little too much, have a gain of more than one, and each time it's going to get just a little bigger, just a little bigger, and pretty soon it's reaching the electronic or mechanical limits, and it's that speaker it can't go any further, so it slows down and kind of lops off the top, and it gets bigger, and, it gets, and everyone's covering their ears because now we have this loud howling sound that we call feedback. But of course, what is it? It's oscillations caused by feedback. So there's one of the things we need to get an oscillator to work is the feedback and the timing just right. So with this 3.3 meters away from the microphone, the timing is such that we get these pulses every one hundredth of a second. Or do we? Well, remember that if we have frequencies other than our fundamental frequency, other than the natural frequency, then we'll get a different wave shape. So if we get these pulses like this, that's not a sine wave. That's a bunch of frequencies. Uh, it takes a lot of analysis to figure out exactly what's there, but that's not a sine wave. That's not a single frequency. That's the not the natural frequency. So the frequencies that are not the natural frequency of the system, that are not 100 hertz, are not going to get amplified and they're not going to be part of this. So what's going to happen? Those frequencies will be filtered out by the system. And so what are we going to get? Not a series of pulses, but a sine wave. Now it depends on the venue because the acoustics are going to dampen some frequencies and not others. We also might get some of the harmonics amplified. So the third harmonic is going to line up such, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. One, two, three. Every third pulse is going to get some more energy into it, so the third harmonic might get a little amplified too. So this might not be a perfect sine wave. It might look like what? It might get a little bit of a something from the third harmonic. Or depending on the phasing, when that third harmonic comes in, we might get more of a triangle wave. And so it depends on what frequencies we get and what amplitude those frequencies are as to what wave we get. But let's assume that all the frequencies but the fundamental are absorbed by the acoustic materials in the building and are not well amplified. So what we get out of that is a sine wave. No other frequencies in it. So not a bunch of pulses, but an actual sine wave in this. So we've made a nice little sine wave oscillator if we have that unity gain. What's going to happen if we have too much gain? Well, these are going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And what's going to happen? Let me redraw this just for clarity. So we start out with a little oscillation. It's going to get bigger, 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 and bigger, and bigger, trying to keep the frequency the same. Eventually, we're going to hit some limits. Either the speaker can't handle it, or the electronics can't handle it, and that's going to lop off our tops. Let's do it right like that. And so what do we have? I'll kind of round them off at first, but eventually they're just going to be pretty much squared off. We're getting close to a square wave, aren't we? So if we have more gain than one, we'll eventually saturate our system somehow and end up with square waves or something very close to them rather than our nice sine wave. So that's why we want that gain of one so we get our sine waves. Have a gain of greater than one, we're going to get square waves. If we have a gain of less than one, we're not going to oscillate. So there's the oscillator you've been in and that prepares us to start talking about electronic oscillators. And I debated which oscillator to talk about first, and I'm going to go probably into more detail on this later, but just to show 
how we can make an electronic oscillator do pretty much the same thing. I decided that the phase shift oscillator was probably the best one to use as an example. So what do we have? Let's just start with a simple amplifier. We'll use a small signal amplifier. So you should have by now seen the video on small signal amplifiers. I'm going to draw the entire circuit, including bypass capacitor. There's our output. Let's put our capacitor there. Here's our bias resistors. Just so it's all there. Something we're familiar with. And we'll put a capacitor right there. Okay, and there's our input. So there's our amplifier. So this will amplify our signal. We could put a microphone out here and get some amplification if that's what we want. But how do we get this to oscillate? Might not have to do anything because there's going to be natural feedback at some frequencies. That's something we have to sometimes compensate for. Probably not in this particular simple circuit, but we might have some problems with it naturally oscillating. There's a saying in electronics that amplifiers oscillate and oscillators amplify. So there will be some characteristics in here that could cause it to oscillate, but probably not at a frequency that the transistor can handle anyway, so probably not going to oscillate. So let's assume there's no natural oscillations here, but sometimes you build an amplifier and it starts oscillating on you, so you have to take steps to stop the oscillations. But this time we want it to oscillate. So what do we need? Uh, we need, um, let's see, media amplification, we've got that. We need a time delay. No, okay, we'll worry about that in a second. We need feedback feedback. So the output needs to go back to the input. So let's do that. Let's just take the output, take it back around, and back to the input. Is that going to work? Well, remember we have to have that time delay too, or we need what's called positive feedback, which is caused by the time delay. So let's take a look at what's going on here. Our signal here, let's say we have a microphone going in there, and we have a sine wave that looks like that. It goes up and down and back up. What's going to happen here? If you don't remember, go back to our small signal amplifier. But remember, as this voltage goes up, the current goes up. And as we get more current through this resistor, that means there's more voltage drop across it. So the voltage here gets further and further from that voltage there. So this voltage will go down, up, and down. So this goes up and down and up. That goes down and up and down. So if we feed that back in, well, as this is going up, we feed it back. This is trying to push it back down. That's negative feedback. That's not going to make it oscillate. In fact, that'll stabilize the circuit if we do it the right way. So we don't want negative feedback. We want positive feedback. So we need to add a time delay so that this comes back a little bit late. So instead of pushing now, it pushes here. Aha! We get that pulse here going down. To push down when this one's going down, that's going to add to the circuit. And of course, opposite here, when this is going up, with that time delay, it's going to be pushing up at the right time. So we need to get a time delay in there. How can we do that? Well, is there any component that takes time to do something? Remember the capacitor. Here's a battery and a resistor and a capacitor. Remember this? Put a switch here, flip that switch, current's going to go into the capacitor, and it's going to take time for that capacitor to store up that energy on these plates. So we're going to get a time delay. So, ah, there's a capacitor and a resistor. There's a natural time delay. Can we adjust these to get just the right time delay? What we want is at the frequency we want to oscillate at, we need to have a 180 degree phase shift. In other words, here's our sine wave. We want this peak, which gets flipped around. We want to delay that so that that flipped peak is pushing down right there. How far is that in the wave? 180 degrees. So we need to delay it just the right amount of time to get a 180 degree phase shift. So can we choose a capacitor and resistor combination to give us a 180 degree phase shift? No, nah, can't be done. Uh, to get a 90 degree phase shift, we'd have to have a resistance of zero, and well, then we don't have the resistance at all. So what can we do? Why don't we add some more stages? Let's put another capacitor here. And 
and I'm going to just skip right to this point and put another capacitor there. And notice I'm putting resistors here that does two things. Without these resistors, these capacitors just act like one capacitor, but this gives us some isolation. And let's bring our feedback over to here. Now, at our frequency that we want to oscillate, we have our capacitive reactance equal to our resistance. So there's our resistance, there's our capacitor, and that's going to have different capacitive reactances at different frequencies. As the frequency goes up, the capacitive reactance goes down. But at some frequency, we can make that capacitive reactance, which is measured in ohms, equal to the resistance. So we have, let's say we have, you know, one K of resistance, and our capacitive reactance equals one kilo ohm, measured in ohms, just like resistance. If they're equal, we'll get a 45 degree phase shift in this whole circuit. So we can get 45 and we could get 90. We're halfway there, but then we need another 90 degrees to get all the way and we can't get 90 degrees. So what I'm gonna do is choose these components such that at the frequency we want this to oscillate at, we get a 60 degree phase shift at each stage. So in other words, all three of these capacitors will be the same all three of these resistors will be the same. What will they be? I'm not going to get into that now. If you want to look up a working phase shift oscillator, you can. I think I might talk about these more in detail later. But just for now, just know that if we want this to oscillate at 100 hertz, we want to choose these components to give us a 60 degree phase shift. So, be technical here. Theta equals 60 degrees. So we want a 60 degree phase shift there. We're a third of the way there. Well, look, three stages. So if we have the same exact components to give another 60 degree phase shift, now we've got 120 degrees. One more time, get another 60 degree phase shift. So we have to design it around the bias resistors of this transistor, but just choose the components right, get the phase shift right at the frequency we want, 60 degrees, 60 degrees, 60 degrees, what do we get? So now our time delay is just right so that when this is going up, it delays it. It's now going down at just the right time. So here's the signal at the base of the transistor. And now we want this to be delayed such that the time it's delayed gives us a 180 degree phase shift coming through the delay circuit so that as this is going up, the feedback is pushing up. As this is going down, the feedback is pushing down. And now we have an oscillator. It should oscillate. And since it's only going to have that 180 degree phase shift at a particular frequency, that's the only frequency that's going to oscillate at. So we're very unlikely to get a lot of harmonics. We might get a little distortion, depending on how the harmonics are phased in. Might not be perfect, but we can get pretty close to a pure sine wave with this particular oscillator. But what else do we need? Oh, we don't want this to run away. We want to have a gain of one. If it has too much gain, it's going to eventually, our sine wave is going to get bigger and bigger and then going to saturate, flatten the tops. Or if we don't have enough gain, it's going to dampen out. Well, how do we control the gain? Well, we already have some negative feedback. Remember from our small signal amplifier, the signal going into the base to the emitter resistor. Remember that as the current into the base goes up, the voltage across this resistor goes up and pushes back against that current. So we get a little bit of a negative feedback there. That's what that resistor is there for. So if we choose that resistor carefully, along with the rest of the circuit, we can get a gain of one. There are other things that mitigate it as we get close to saturation. It's going to tend to cause more negative feedback, and that's going to tend to reduce the gain. But then again, we're going to get a little bit of distortion. And that's why a lot of sine wave oscillators don't produce perfect sine waves, because they have to start to saturate just a little bit. So it starts to go up, and this starts to flatten out just a little bit, giving you just a few odd harmonics in there. Just a little bit of flattening, not a perfect sine wave. But then if we need that on the output, we could put a filter out there to filter out all but the wanted frequency. So we can deal with that. So that's 
a pretty good analog of the auditorium, how it produces oscillations. This will do about the same thing for about the same reason, because we get the feedback coming in at just the right time, and it only amplifies the one frequency that it naturally wants to oscillate at, so we get naturally sine waves for the most part, although we might get some harmonics in there, but we can deal with that. So in subsequent videos, we'll be talking about other oscillators. There are harmonic oscillators that use harmonic circuits, such as tank circuits, and there are phase shift oscillators, such as this one, which we won't talk too much more about, but we will probably look at a working circuit. There are relaxation oscillators that use a charging and discharging capacitor for their timing. We'll take a closer look at all those down the road. So if you'd like to help other people find these videos and learn electronics technology for free, you can give this video a thumbs up. You can subscribe and hit that gray bell when you do so you get notified when I put up new videos. And you can take my free course on electronics technology at Vocademy. Just go to vocademy.net. A big thank you to my patrons and other donors. I could not make these videos and I could not keep Vocademy free without your support. You can go to patreon.com slash vocademy and pledge your support or go to support.vocademy.net and find other ways you can help make Vocademy and these videos possible. Again, a big thank you to my patrons at Patreon and thanks to everyone for watching.